Okay, we ready? Okay, good. Welcome everyone to the uh, September meeting, meeting number 92. And uh, we, uh, we don't have a, uh, as packed an agenda as we've had in some of the more recent uh, meetings, so uh, we'll probably be out of here a bit earlier uh, than we normally get out. Uh, just to start off with introductions, of course, most of you that attend these uh, you know, know everyone at the table, but I'll go through them anyways. To my right, Chris Halver. Uh, to my left, uh, Tony Wilkinson, and then Bill Bruce, Harvey Alexander, Mike Lyons, Rick Georgeson from my office, Elaine Balchinian. Is this your first meeting, Elaine? No, I've been here many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Elaine, Elaine is uh, representing uh, the Office of Parks and Recreation, uh, Historic Preservation as well. So, um, Don, Don Sefos, John Brust, and Larry Eckhouse. Uh, has everyone had an opportunity to review the minutes from the previous meeting? Are there any need? Is there any need for changes or addition to those minutes? As usual, Rick uh, did a great job with them. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to adopt those mean minutes. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. All in favor of adopting uh, the minutes from our June 21st meeting as uh, presented, uh, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. <coughs> okay, they're adopted. Um, any opportunity for the members of the public who wish to uh, speak or offer any comments? Any comments from the public? Okay. I will kick right into the report section. Uh, I don't have a report this <coughs> to offer, uh, so we'll go directly to the commission members. Is there any commission member who has a report? Gene, I'd like to bring up uh, one topic for the board to consider. The, uh, the aesthetics of the building, particularly from 155, and to me are not particularly inviting. I sat out there the other day, and the exterior of the building, the building grounds, um, to someone who doesn't know, I think it looks like the building's abandoned. And, and I guess um, it just doesn't look inviting. It doesn't, if you were out on 155 and you didn't intend to come to the pine bush, I don't think you would drive in just to see. Um, but for the sign that's out there, it, it just doesn't have a good look to it. Um, an inviting look or a, a new creative look, et cetera, et cetera. We've put an awful lot of money into the building, and the programs are great. And the, I see the wrapped car outside that Don helped purchase. And, you know, there's so, many, like it. <laughs> there's so many good things, but yet the look, the exterior of the building grounds and whatnot, I just think some, we should address that somehow. And I know there's some issues about, um, not forever wild, but um, there's a permit. I mean, there's a U.S. Fish and Wildlife permit um, that Neil manages with Fish and Wildlife and DEC. Um, and one of the things that we address this year is being able to mow or trim the vegetation. Um, and we just recently did that. <laughs> not, not to you. <laughs> we we did. I mean, around Don't, the side. I'm not giving you the contract from my house. More <laughs> 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 my own. <laughs> well, you, you know, there has to be a balance, of course, between the idea of having native le native landscaping and native vegetation and having an inviting building. Um, I don't know. What are your suggestions? We can't have we can't have turf grass. What I was going to do is was landscape it, turf grass it, and then say uh, that this is not what we should be doing. <laughs> right. All right. So, <laughs> set it up as an exhibit. And, uh, and, and There's enough of those on Washington <laughs> Avenue extension already. <laughs> There's plenty of those. <laughs> you know, the office park that lines Washington Avenue extension is a prime <coughs> example of how not to treat the pine bush. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Out of the, and and walk-in exhibit of what not to do. And it'll look so inviting, people will come. So that, that's where I'm coming from. But. 
Well, there's got to be some compromise. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, maybe what we could do is, if other board members are interested, we could set up a time to meet and just take a look at it. John, you're close. Your office is close. Yep. Yep. We could come over. We could meet. Uh, we could have Neil, who looks, you know, he oversees the permit um, for fish and wildlife. What we can and can't do this year, and what we could possibly do next year. And Jeff, as a center director. And and if and if others, <coughs> if you disagree and you, and you think I'm just out to lunch, then, then I'll move on. I, I just, as I was sitting there the other day, I, I just said, boy, I gotta bring this up. No, yeah. it, and could you get someone from Fish and Wildlife at that meeting? Chris, so just so they understand that board members and staff and other people get complaints, basically. Gee, place, can we do that? Is that building abandoned? Yeah, or we could have Robin and Kathy come here after you guys have your meeting when I meet with them annually and show them and say, we need to develop a, a, a more pleasing aesthetic with native plants, which may require not using the incidental take permit that we have currently, but getting a separate permit, which would just do a lot It's a process. Chris, so uh, maybe that's a start, Bill. Instead of instead of having Fish and Wildlife come for this first discussion meeting, John, is that okay with you? Yeah. I think it's okay. Chris, I think I mentioned this to you earlier in the summer, but I've finally been impressed about the native vegetation around the building. I think what you're here inside is very impressive, absolutely. But I think from the outside, from 155 looking in, and the kind of folks that are not not you know we want to attract new visitors. You're the educated visitor. No. You're on board, mm -hmm. and, and those that are that are friends of the pine bush and whatnot are on board. And if and if that's okay, that we just keep our our circle of friends, then that's fine. Well, um, this is supposed to be. I mean, as a biologist, I think it's great. Um, it yeah. seems to me that the the thing to do is to try to educate the public, uh, rather than our saying, okay, this is what the aesthetics are. I mean, to me, it is it's aesthetically pleasing because I know what's out there and what, yeah. what's. So um, yeah, that's kind of my point. The first couple of years when it was getting going, it wasn't aesthetic as pretty, and now it's yeah, like, yeah, it's what it should be. But that is a biologist's perspective. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. I, you know, because I know the place. But as I was at the light the other day, looking at it, it just struck me that for those that are unfamiliar with this place, it, it, uh, it, we won't get the reaction that we're looking for. I, I guess. Or we may not, and I'm just throwing that out to the board. And again, if I'm out to lunch, then that's, and we'll move on. Don't address features. But again, you know, with education. Well, I, I just wanted to weigh in. I, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I'm okay. in managing a lot of parks and historic sites. One of the things that we've done recently is partner with this new group called the New York State Independent Flower Growers Marketing Council. Uh, or Flower Power Group, and what they're doing is um, they're a group of independent growers who are interested in in providing, well, to, to retain New York businesses and to promote plant material that's native and also will do well in local, you know, local community gardens, basically to sort of combat the kind of big box landscaping programs that bring in a lot of invasives and, and species that they actually don't do well. So anyway, um, and I also, uh, you know, I, I understand, I totally um, support the, the idea of native and trying to improve aesthetics, but, uh, but I, I think you're right. I think that it, you know, you've got to make a place really appealing to people who know nothing about what the message is. And so maybe I could um, bridge, bridge the group to that group too if, if we wanted to. Um, get a private uh, a company interested in, in helping with pr provision of plant material. That, I think it's, only, it's only the, the first 50 feet. <coughs> it's only the, the first part of your, your entrance to the pine bush that I'm probably reacting to. Once you're inside, once you're driving in, it's all of a sudden you see something very special. Um, it's that first introduction, I think, right now that it sort of troubles me. You have to work with you have to work with the county and the mowing cycle yeah. and the limits that they have on them from DPC and the service and when they can mow because the entire right away is occupied with corners is, is part of the issue of why right now they're not allowed to mow the right away for the new lot because you've got corners with the nectar all throughout. The you know this we can work with there there are ways to work with the service and DPC. 
and I think there's a balance. Jeff, you've been waiting to, as the Senate director. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate the comments and, and, and uh, agree generally. We get, this, we get this a lot from the public. We have taken steps, and in the short time I've been here, Chris and I have had a couple of discussions about this. Um, we know that the sign, the new sign has made, made a big difference, um, a huge difference in, in terms of people's perception of what we're doing. Um, recently, mowing out there, even though you didn't notice, um, and that's understandable too. That's made a little bit of a difference, at least now, a few weeks ago, you couldn't see the bottom of the sign, but we've done that, uh, garden box or native landscaping. We're also, Elaine, working with um, a native landscape expert, and I'm going to talk about this in my report, now, um, regarding doing some native landscaping right out front of the building along the north wall, which, of course, doesn't address the the entrance way, but you know there are possibilities that we expand. So, so it's been something that's on my agenda. Chris and I have talked about whether there are other things, and I've raised him a couple of you know ideas of whether we put up a sign saying this is right up front, saying this is preserved, and sort of explains to people why it's not mowed. Um, whether there's something we can do at the front of the building where the clock faces um, to make it more appealing. It's not been a high priority because we just put in that brand new sign and we're taking other measures. But it's certainly something I've been thinking about and we welcome further discussion about. So we'll follow up. Um, John, I'll reach out to you and we'll set up a meeting okay. to just have a, you know, take a walk out front with, with Neil and, and Jeff and, and Elaine, if you could maybe give me that information for okay. the Flower Power Group. Yeah. Great. You know, I think, uh, I think Harvey makes a great point um, about the need for education. Uh, because there is a valuable lesson out there and uh, you know if you're uninformed you drive by and you don't get that lesson uh, what I'm thinking is Jeff I don't know if it might be an opportunity also to let's say interest uh, a paper like Metroland maybe they do a feature story on it about uh, the transformation of this site from a bank to uh, uh, kind of the kind of nature preserve that it is now, uh, you know, and, and why it looks the way it does, and why it's important that it looks that way. Uh, also, I was wondering, I know that you met recently, Chris, with uh, your counterpart from the Long Island Pine Barrens Commission and my counterpart from Long Island, Peter Scully. Um, what what does their visitor center or building look like? Do we do we know? They they don't have they don't have one. They, they're housed. Okay. <laughs> They're housed within uh, Suffolk County Water Authority okay. uh, building, and their their landscaping is is traditional landscaping. Some natives, um, but not not to the extent that we went. Right. Right. So, okay. Great, great discussion, John. Um, I, I've I've heard similar comments from a lot of people actually, and it seems like I always. You know, spend time trying to launch into a, yes, a non a non biologist's explanation of what they're looking at. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I think you're right, Harvey. I mean, the opportunity for education here is before us. You know, it really is. So, okay. Um, okay. Any other uh, reports or discussion items from commission members? No. Okay, we'll turn it over to Chris then. Okay. Uh, thanks, Gene. <coughs> Uh, just first off, there's a couple of things. Um, I usually point you to your update in the board packet. Um, I'm not going to highlight anything in that specifically because there's some things I wanted to talk about otherwise, but please take the time to go through and read that. Um, there's a lot of stuff that the staff has done this whole season, the field season, um, in every program area, and um, as usual, it's pretty impressive. So I, I'd ask you to please read that in the meeting. Um, and I wanted to recognize our, our stewardship and our conservation science seasonals. We've got um, Alyssa, Ashley, Goody, and Lily in the room. You can just raise your hands and say hi. Just to say a shout out and say thanks for all your hard work this season. Um, did you, want, you guys want to come up and say anything? Really, they need the recognition. So if thanks. you speak, you get a free uh, bagel. <laughs> no bagels unless you speak. <laughs> um, just a couple other things to report on. Um, at our last meeting in June, we talked about um, 
the reporting that we had to do as a state authority um, in the Paris system, the public authority reporting information system. We were in full compliance, or I should say we are in full compliance with our reporting, um, meeting the deadline prior to June 30th, which is uh, good news as our first year. <clears throat> in the past, we've had visitors here um, from different countries to learn about what we do in the preserve from our, our ecological and our scientific work, but also our public outreach, our education, our environmental education, um, our protection work. And they've come from a, kind of a joint project that we've been involved with called the International Center of the Conservation, uh, or the Cap International Center of the Capital Region. Um, and in June this year, we had some folks from Beijing. And in August, we had a group from Russia. So it's nice to have different perspectives from different parts of the world and how people, other people are addressing similar issues. Um, uh, like Gene said, I had a meeting about a month and a half ago with both the board chair and the executive director of the Central Pine Barrens Commission, which is our counterpart in Long Island. Um, their law was set up based on our law, and they're looking to do something similar, potentially, that, that we did is to, to become more independent. Um, and of course, that's kind of a long process, as you remember. Um, over the last three years, we've gone through a lot of changes. So they're at the beginning of this stage, and I think um, they're going to look to our, what we've done and what we've learned to, for some help. So you may hear more about that. And then finally, um, as a state authority, our budgeting process is now vastly accelerated, as I look to Lisa, our Director of Finance and Operations. So our budgeting will start with our staff October 24th instead of February. Um, so we can have a, board or a budget prepared, a draft budget prepared for your consideration at the next meeting in December. Because we have to have that budget submitted into Paris by uh, January 1st of 2013. And that's for fiscal year starting April 1st, 2013, going through March of 2014. Uh, and that's all I have. Um, yeah, and I just want to say that the amount of uh, work and dedication that uh, particularly Chris and Lisa put into coming into compliance in rapid order with the new reporting requirements applicable to public authorities uh, was nothing short of amazing. Uh, I saw it a bit from the outside, uh, but even from what I saw, uh, I was very impressed because it, it required uh, the uh, collection of a lot of information and the pre presentation of that information in a, in a way that just uh, it, it took a lot of time. We yeah. should also say thanks to Larry, our counsel, for yeah, helping exactly. with a lot of the policies that we put, had to put yeah. together. Yeah, Larry as well. I don't mean to overlook Larry's contributions because he was a central part of that effort, but it's amazing that in such short time uh, that the, the commission has been able to uh, turn on a dime and get all of these reporting requirements satisfied. I don't think anybody from the controller's office expected it so quickly. And, uh, you know, so now, now you've set a high standard for yourself, so. Uh, but I just want to congratulate you on that because it, it was quite a monumental effort. Thanks. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, next, we'll turn to the technical committee for a project review uh, summary from Neil. Morning. Um, I don't have the, the usual quarterly technical committee report for you all because we haven't actually met. There have been no new projects that have required the technical committee to get together and, and discuss, but we have been in touch consistently via email. And there are kind of four projects that I wanted to highlight today, one of which is the hydrology report from H2H that H2H is working on. They are, I'm expecting the draft report on the background of the pine bush hydrogeology by the end of the month. They only recently secured a huge piece of the, the kind of the missing link of the hydrology information that we're looking for from the New York State Geological Survey. And they just received that within the last couple of weeks. So they're going to get me a draft report by the end of September. And I expect to have at least a draft of that, if not the final version of that, to you all for the December meeting. And the H2H has been fantastic to work with. The second project I wanted to mention is the, is the landfill, landfill expansion and the restoration project associated with the landfill. 
the city of Albany continues to, to be going above and beyond and coordinating with, with myself, with the commission, and with the DEC on every aspect of, of that restoration project. The, uh, the pretty much the entire former, former trailer park um, that used to house, I don't know, Bill, how many? 50, 60 mobile Originally homes. Originally it was up to almost 100, it was like 96. So there are four mobile homes left that have been consolidated on one little street. And everything you all saw last year that was wide open sand, the new 12s, so about 12 wetlands, including two new stream channels, are completely vegetated, predominantly with grasses and wildflowers. But it looks great. Things are definitely moving in the right direction. And the consultants of Pied Ecological Services that the city hired is, has <coughs> established test plots on the cap landfill itself to begin the process of evaluating how do we turn the cap landfill when it's closed into native pine bush habitat that can help bridge the link between Corner Burns East where we are now and the big section of the preserve at, at, um, on, the, on the east side of Rap Road and going down to Fuller. Right now, of course, the landfill and the former trailer park were a huge block, um, a huge fragmenting feature on the landscape preventing plants and animals from moving across the preserve. And, and in the end, if this, if this works, I think it's going to be very successful not only for, for the preserve and for the wildlife that are here, but also for all the parties involved. So that, that continues to move along well. Um, we also, as far as an update, you've all heard from the town of Colony that the town of Colony was considering rezoning a whole bunch of land in the western end of the town of Colony out along Curry Kings Road. That rezone did, did occur and they did revert, I don't remember the, all the exact details, I know Mike would know, of the rezone, but most, most important to the commission was that, that when the comprehensive plan for the town of Colony was adopted, they included conservation overlay districts and that conservation overlay district, while there was a request to remove that overlay district, that district remains. Which means irrelevant of how it's zoned, there are a whole set of environmental considerations that, that developers will need to consider, including the Pine Bush. There are seven, right, seven conservation overlay districts in the town of Colony, the Pine Bush is one of them. And so irrelevant, as far as uh, irrelevant of the, of the zoning, I think, the technical committee and hopefully you all are happy that that conservation overlay district remains because it does provide an additional layer of, of, of evaluation and environmental considerations for, for new development in the town of Colony. The last, the last project I wanted to mention is that I, commented, I was asked to comment on draft um, site plan regulations for the city of Albany. Right now they have a commercial pine bush district that comes all the way out to Spring, Springsteen Street. And the, the, our biggest comment, and Chris and I looked at that, was that there was a, the, the lines for what the city was considering Pine Bush in development didn't match the commission's study area boundary going all the way to Fuller Road. Their district was, was shy of that. So that was our, our most significant recommendation was, let's bring those lines together. The city's new comp plan acknowledges and, and endorsed the commission's management plan, so it only makes sense then that the regulations coming out of that would uh, would follow up on that and, and bring those lines together. Does bringing the lines together, is that going to uh, increase or decrease what we're considering to be Pine Bush area? Well, we're, it's not going to change what we're considering. Well, to be all right, all right. But what? From, from what the city was looking yeah, at, yeah. when they look at um, regulations in the Pine Bush, it would, it would increase it slightly. Yep. You know, there, there, are some, there, are, there are some gaps. So what are about two blocks? I'm sorry? I mean, what's, what's the distance? Yeah, it'd be several blocks. It's, you several know, blocks, okay. a quarter of a mile. Okay. Yeah, it's about a quarter of a mile. There's basically a gap from Fuller Road up to Crossgates Commons. Okay. In the city of Albany, that's not considered Pine Bush. Okay. Yeah, the other road I didn't look familiar with. Yeah, I had to look up Springsteen, <laughs> Springsteen Street, so I had never heard it before. I drive it every day. City could never keep that sign up when it was <laughs> <laughs> stolen on every Oh, yeah, street. sure. It it probably. Did, yeah. yeah, when you were in DPW, sure. But, should have hung it from the uh, power line to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, next, we'll receive a report on the Discovery Center from Jeff. <clears throat> Thank you. I attended the annual summit of the Association of Nature Center Administrators with uh, close to 200 of my colleagues from across the country. Um, it's very informative, networking on, and work and uh, sessions on facility management, budgets, nonprofit versus government institutions, 
friends support groups, uh, trends affecting the industry, including climate change. It's also a great resource for talking about issues like, you know, what 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 when visitor centers look like and what other nature centers look like at entrance ways, and you know, uh, so so that's going to be a great resource down the road. <clears throat> With regards to the building and grounds, the building itself and some exhibits are beginning to show some wear and tear and signs of age. Um, projects in various phases are caulking of the building, replacement of the ADA compliant front door motors, uh, exhibit repairs, parts replacement, some new signage. One major project that we're really excited about uh, was replacing 92 light bulbs in the exhibit area using 10 watt LEDs to replace 75 watt bulbs. So half the cost is being reversed by a national grid. Um, some numbers here for you. The gross annual kilowatt hour savings is 18300 The annual electric cost savings is $2,200. Uh, CO2 savings in pounds is $20,129. Um, and the payback is only 2.3 years. So after that 2.3 years, um, we start seeing actual savings. Uh, we're also working on preparations for New landscaping, as I talked about, along the north wall, uh, the new discovery corner er exhibit area, working with National Grid on installing an electric vehicle charging system, uh, continuing to enhance and improve the discovery shop, and Kelly Batchelder has been doing a, a great job with that. Um, regarding outreach, we've been ident intensifying our outreach efforts, as you know, and focusing a bit more on national media. Uh, communications and outreach director Wendy Craney's uh, stellar efforts were well rewarded uh, with the help of Neil Gifford um, with a story on the corner of blue butterflies. Our release was picked up by the AP and ran in, in more than 25 news outlets across the country, including the Wall Street Journal, the Weather Channel, uh, the Times Union took, picked it up on the front page, four local television networks, NPR outlets. So, so we're, we were pretty excited. This is the first time a commission story has received this much national attention, um, and it helps pave the way for future interest in our work. Uh, we've also had our wonderful new displays, which you saw last meeting at various public events. We're preparing for Smokey Bear Day on October 8th. We've had ads in various outlets. Uh, we've been included in the Governor's Path Through History Initiative, um, where I was excited to learn that the very birth of Albany you know, was related to the pine bush and that the original stockade um, for Fort Orange was comprised of pine bush trees. Uh, and we have a large piece on display in our artifacts exhibit. Uh, upgrades to our print and online newsletter. You should have all received the um, print version of the the newly, slightly re revised uh, newsletter. So if you haven't seen that, we have some here for you. Um, in other news, we are now <coughs> officially open year-round uh, with Mondays uh, as, a, as an additional day, except for New Year's Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve, and Christmas Day. So we can now say we're open daily which is also great because we won't have to turn away those little kids at the front door anymore. That may break my heart when they come, and the parents too. They get here and they work well. Um, you've hopefully all seen the Subaru Auto Wrap, which was a, a great project that uh, Aaron and Wendy and I and Chris and others all had input and outside designers. If you haven't seen, if you came in early, take a look. And I'll just mention that if you look at the back, we just received it this morning, so we're gonna have to send it back and fix the back because they, they were too low, so you know things are not in place. But we'll get them to fix that. Um, finally, I just want to commend uh, Aaron Kynel and the education staff on the great work they're doing. And, and I'm gonna not steal Aaron's thunder because she's got a great presentation for you later on. Any questions? I have a question about opening. I'm, I'm so impressed that you're able to open more. So congratulations on that. And how, did, is that? Is there a return on investment in that, or is that just at this point ease, there, ease of it's, operations? We've just sort of restructured how we're how we're operating, um, so we're not hiring it anyone additional. Cost you more to do. That's right. Awesome. That's right. We're just kind of moving people around right. and um, <coughs> turning on the lights and all the exhibits and and right. getting the, the uh, shop up and running and moving people as, as to where they're. So it's a little bit of logistical planning and making sure that we have coverage. That's great. But we figured that's out a way to do that, and we are also. Um, be bringing in a volunteer on Mondays to help as well. And congrats on the national coverage. I, I heard some of that was great. It was really great. Thank you. Jeff, is some of the new um, lighting that they're installing new technology? Because I know 
when the building first opened, there was some LEED certifications, and I would have thought that many of the, uh, the lighting at the time when it was designed would have been up to the uh, most um, highest standards. So I was Five years is a long time in, in yeah. the world of technology, and so yes, um, there have been significant advances in LED um, technologies, including just recently dimmable LED bulbs, which is what we had. We did have a huge problem, you know, the things you don't find out until you're actually doing it. Once we brought the lift in and got, it, got the guys up, up there, we realized that the bulbs up there were a slightly different size, um, and the electrician was saying, well, I've never seen I mean, they've been in the business 30 years. I've never seen bulbs like this before. So um, they had to remove the ballast from every one of the upper um, light fixtures rather than pay $150 for a new light fixture. So we figured out a solution, which was also great. Um, but yes, there, are, there have been advances and we're really, just recently these <coughs> dimmable LED bulbs came out, which are great. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Next, we'll hear from Lisa with the financial report. Good morning. Does everybody have their Titan color financial report? Um, we'll begin our review of financial statements with a statement of financial activity through the month of July, so ending July 31st of the year. Um, first, looking at revenue, dues and contributions, are higher than budget, and this is specifically due to a donation from the Friends Group this year. Government grant uh, and contract. Government grants came in lower than budget, and this is based on an estimate throughout the year. This is a direct correlation to spending, so we're, we're down for the year in spending. Um, so we're down for grant income. Um, mitigation fees is slightly higher, and this is based on actual tonnage from the landfill, and also an additional payment from the residents and property near Crossgate Mall this quarter. Investment <coughs> income is flat, um, and we realize this at the end of the year. It's typically not taken. Uh, lease revenue is on budget. There's a slight variance due to our rental income from our staff at the Barron's House, which is our seasonal staff. Um, other revenue is slightly higher than budget, and this is due to an increase in program fees and merchandise sales goal. Total revenue came at 79% through the month of July. Uh, moving on to expenses, uh, personnel and fringe are under budget, and this is due to vacancies and bulk of timing of our big benefit payments, as in New York State retirement payments. Uh, travel and training are under budget due to the timing of expenses versus a budgeted, uh, the budgeted month. And the same goes for the next four categories, uh, contractual, communications, occupations, and supplies and equipment. They're all under budget due to the timing um, of budgeted items in our spending. We had a conservative um, plan in place because we did not have a cash plan at this point. We actually received our actual cash in August. So we are proceeding um, with several budgeted items and contracts. Um, other expenses uh, are $220,000 under due to the timing of the land purchase, which was actually budgeted in the month of July and we have not purchased it at this point. Overall expenses came in lower than budget at 52%, giving us a significantly higher net income of $143,584. Are there any questions? Any and at the yes. end of the year, what do you foresee for the government grants and contracts? Do you see that coming in? Yes, we have initiated five large contracts in September that we held off on and have budgeted toward the end of the year. We budgeted some in the summer. Um, but we didn't actually receive our cash until August for the first and second quarter. Okay. The next financial statement in your packet is the statement of net assets. Under assets, cash and cash equivalents, this is our operating cash, and this decreased due to the timing of grant payments from DEC. Um, Conservation land reserves. Our conservation land reserves remain unchanged. Grants receivable. These are the grants funds that are due um, from DEC from April through July, the end of the year. And these are actually zero. We were paid for these in total in August. Accounts receivable is money owed for the second quarter mitigation. This was also paid in August. 
inventory remained unchanged. Prepaid expenses are zero. Investments had a positive performance in July, increasing approximately $21,200 for the year end. Total assets increased $105,000 due to an increase in AR, investments in capital assets, and an increase in investment income. And the capital asset increased due to a recent purchase this quarter, which was the Subaru that you see outside. Um, moving on to liabilities. Accounts payable and accrued expenses decreased due to the reduction of accounts payable for the year. Deferred revenue is at zero. So total liabilities decreased due to the reduction of accounts payable and deferred revenue both for the year. Looking at net assets, investments in capital assets increased due to the purchase this quarter of the Subaru. Reserved assets remain the same and unreserved increased due to a positive net income and income, uh, positive income in our investment statements. Overall total net as assets increased due to a positive net income and increase in investments. Are there any questions on net assets? Okay. Final report in our packet is the investment summary, um, which are three funds. We'll start with the reserve fund. The reserve fund is doing really well with a 4.62% gain as of July 31st. And all of these statements are as of July 31st. Um, and both the Discovery Center endowment and the large endowment um, are coming in relatively even at less than 1%. And this is due, the equity markets were down um, for April through July. They are now up, so the endowment is actually, to the end of August 31st, up 7.32% gain. Um, so overall, investments had a positive performance through the month of July for the gain of $21,223. Any questions on that? No. And on a final note, we, um, now some of you know we recently completed two audits. Um, New York State Compensation Insurance Board rating audit uh, board just came in. And the second audit was the desk audit for the comptroller's office. Um, it involved detailed analysis of expenses over two fiscal years, extensive amount of work um, for every expense we have incurred. And I'd like to acknowledge and give a special thank you to Marty Sign for all of her hard work in pulling this information together. Thank you, Marty. And thank you, Chris, for all your work. Just so people know, that was a three-week project. So thank you, Lisa thank you. and Mark. Thank you. You guys pulled it together. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, two fairly brief uh, action items. Chris, can you take us through those? Sure. Um, action item A, the very first one, the blue one in your packet, is uh, re-election of officers. Um, annually, we have to elect officers Vice Chair, Secretary, and Treasurer. The chair is, is um, statutor statutorily designated. Set up in law, was that. Um, so uh, proposal is for Vice Chair for Elaine Bolchinian to remain as a representative for state parks. Secretary uh, Don Sapos representing the uh, town of Gilliland uh, to remain as secretary. And John Brust, citizen member, to remain as treasurer. Questions or discussion? Make a motion. Okay. A motion to uh, move it to a vote. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor of adopting action item A, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. Action item A is adopted unanimously. Thank you. Action item B um, is this color in your packet, salmon. <laughs> I tried to avoid the color same. I like salmon. <laughs> um, these are, um, this is another policy that we need in place as a state authority. Um, and this is something that uh, both Larry and I worked on, um, more Larry than me. Um, so these are guidelines for the disposition of property, which includes both um, real property um, and personal property. Personal property could be something as 
small as a vehicle or some equipment um, that the commission owns, and that would be any equipment $5,000 or more based on fair market value or real property. Um, it's pretty unlikely that the commission would sell any real property that it held um, just because of the way we would have property come to us. Uh, but of course, any, any of that would, would, any real property sale would have to come to the board for a vote and DEC would be involved in that. Um, and the draft guidelines are, are attached to that. Those guidelines are, are based on similar ones that other public authorities and other state authorities have used. Larry, is there anything you want to add in addition to what Chris just said? No. Thank you very much for your work on that. Any discussion on action item B? Property were, for example, donated to the commission, and the commission were to turn it over to the New York State. Would that then follow that procedure? Um, if we sold it, yes. I wouldn't expect that the commission would sell property to the state. It would, it, if it would transfer between the commission to DEC or Parks, it would be a, it would be a transfer. It don't, transfer jurisdiction yeah so we wouldn't sell it that, that's why I, I we have to have this policy but I don't I don't foresee the Commission being in a situation at least at this point where we would we would we would own any real property and we would sell it it's a possibility I just don't, I, I can't come up with an example okay. yeah I think the more pragmatic application of this would be the disposition of some item of tangible property, for example, a, a tractor, right, or a truck, Subaru. Right. or a Subaru someday. <laughs> right. Subaru. That's true. If the Subaru, by, by the time it's on its last legs, if it has a value of five thousand dollars or more, um, we would have to follow these guidelines, among others. Um, depending on how we purchased it, we would have approval from DEC uh, to the management budget office. Any further discussion or questions on item B? I'll, I'll move that we adopt this policy. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor of adopting action item B as presented, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. Action item B is adopted unanimously. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have two presentations that we'll receive, the first being uh, on, from Aaron Canal. On uh, education programming. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Kyle, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you about the education program of the Albany Pine Woods Preserve Commission. I just wanted to give you a brief update on what we've been doing for the past five years since the Discovery Center has been opened. And I have a short presentation just to give you an overview of the education program, who we are, what we've been doing, where we are now, and where we hope to be in the future. The goal of the education program is, in a nutshell, to raise awareness of the Albany Pine Bush and to foster a sense of stewardship for the landscape. And that goal is reflected in our management plan. And the goal is based on an idea that was first articulated by a National Parks interpreter 
whose name was Enos Mills, and he really was the first to clearly articulate there's a positive relationship between how much a visitor knows and cares about a resource and their desire to protect the resource. In addition to that benefit to the Albany Pine Bush, that as more people hopefully come to understand what this place is, uh, hopefully they'll come to care about its protection, but also the Albany Pine Bush and the Discovery Center represent a significant, significant public benefit as well. And just based on some of the feedback that we get in our surveys after we conduct programs, we have just recently actually, um, we got a lot of really wonderful positive feedback from the public. One person wrote as a comment to the program that she attended, I wish this program never ended. I just wanted it to keep going. So there's definitely a significant public benefit as well. <coughs> The work that we do obviously would not be possible without our staff. Our staff are the backbone of the education program. And I'd like to briefly introduce um, our education staff. I think many of you have met them, but just to make sure everybody has a face to a name, I'd like to introduce our staff. So if the education staff can stand when I say your name, that would be great. Our education program assistant is Blake Etchison. And we have two environmental educators. We have Jackie Citrinity and Sarah Poggi. And we share a staff person with the science department, Amanda Dillon. She works as our field ecologist and also as an environmental educator. And we are really fortunate to have such a dedicated team of professional educators as we do. Really, the success that we've achieved in the past five years would not have been possible without all of their hard work. Also <clears throat> critical to the work that we do are the contributions of our volunteers. We have four volunteer programs within the education department. We have volunteer naturalists that are informal educators out on the trails of the preserve. We have volunteer educators which lead education programs. We have volunteer docents that work inside the Discovery Center and right on the grounds of the Discovery Center educating the public and interpreting our exhibits. And we also have volunteer junior docents which do the role of a docent, but they are kids in grades seven through 12 and contribute a great deal to the interpretation here. We also have wildlife ambassadors and we have live animals here at the Albany Pine Bush and they certainly help to articulate some of the, um, the themes here that we have at the Albany Pine Bush too. What I'm going to be focusing on mostly is our programs. We do a lot more than offer programs. I just wanted to mention really quickly, we do, um, we have a, a very active role in the publications that come out of the Discovery Center. We also work on special projects. We have a new backpack project that will be launching soon where kids can rent a backpack at the front desk and take it out on the trail and they'll have binoculars and a hand lens field guide where they can explore when they're out on the trail. Um, so we, this is just kind of a, a piece of what we do here at the education, in the education department. So overall we have public programs, school programs, we offer programs to special interest groups, um, we go out and do outreach programs, and of course a lot more. Sometimes we're in costume. <laughs> And we offer our education programs here at the Discovery Center and also other places. We go out to schools, we go out to organizations, and um, we, especially with the recent fiscal climate and schools being limited in their ability to take field trips, we are able to go out to schools to offer programs so that we can maintain a relationship with them. And hopefully once um, things improve with school budgets, they'll be able to come back out to the Discovery Center. So taking a closer look at the different program areas, we have our public programs. Our public programs are just that, interpretive programs that we offer to the public. They cover a diversity of topics, anything from art, human history, ecology, uh, natural history. We have a lot of different programs that we offer. 
and we offer them to a diverse audience. Since the opening of the Discovery Center in 2007, we have led more than 620 programs for the public alone. And annual participation in our public programs has increased a great deal since 2008 um, by 300%. Uh, so it's been a, a really huge increase in participation in our programs. And just to show you graphically where we started out, in 2008, we, were, we had about 800 people attending public programs each year, um, and now we're up above um, 3,500. It's tailing off here just because we haven't finished 2012 yet. So that's just the data through September. We also lead school programs. We have a variety of hands-on programs. They're all based on New York State learning standards. So that provides an extra incentive for schools to come out and participate because uh, not only do they get to experience the pine bush and what a unique place it is, but they can also achieve their learning standards, which are really important. Um, over the past five years, we've worked with more than 20 local public school districts. It's actually 26 public school districts that we have a relationship with, and that represents about 50 different schools that have participated in our programs just in the past five years. Um, and we work with a lot of different private schools and homeschool networks too. And actually that number 16 has gone up to 30. So we actually have a relationship with 30 different private schools in the area. And this is just a, a brief summary of where we are in 2012. We're not done with it yet. The fall we get a lot of schools that come out to the Discovery Center, so um, that graph will be changing. But the green line here um, with the triangles shows where we are now. And although some of the peaks may have been higher in previous years, on average we are up as far as school attendance goes. So from um, 2010 to 2011, we went up by about 200 students visiting the Discovery Center. And already where we are right now in September, we're 17% ahead of where we were last year at this time. So is, we are... Is the abscissa number of students? I'm sorry? Is the abscissa the number of students? Yes, we have, yep, number of students, yes. <laughs> hey, Erin, the, yes. uh, so the, the challenge, the monetary, the, the funding challenge that school districts are in is not influenced. I guess my takeaway here is that a few years ago we were really we really feared that we would see a significant drop off in school participation here because of the right. economy. Right. We not. haven't experienced that, and I think our ability to be able to go out to the schools has helped with that. Okay. There are a few schools, yep, that have said, listen, our field trip budget got cut. We can't come out, and we say, well, we'll come there. And so, okay. and, there, and then we go out there, and we can maintain that relationship. Um, all, one thing that that we've seen that some schools have not been able to return is the issue of ticks in the preserve, which um, which continues to be kind of an ongoing concern with schools. But again, if we can go out to the school, then we can help them to, and, and I think as more people come to understand that's part of being outdoors, almost no matter where you are now in the Capital District, hopefully we'll be able to work with schools on that issue. Um, and also re related to John's question, we've been very fortunate in that our friends group has been very supportive of our education programs and they have a transportation fund where they're able to provide funding for transportation to schools in need to enable them to come out to the Discovery Center. So they, um, the friends will actually pay the full cost of transportation for a school, which can be up to $350. Uh, per school just to get a bus to come out to the Discovery Center. So the Friends has a grant and the schools apply and as long as they meet certain um, criteria, they get the funding and they're able to come out. So that's really helped with schools, um, especially the City of Albany schools, Schenectady City Schools and Troy City Schools. <coughs> We also do programs for special interest groups and um, we've 
work with a lot of different groups, any um, groups from scouts to senior groups to hiking clubs, and uh, they come here, we go there as well. So we've had, a, I'm very proud of this, the success that we've had over the past five years, and looking forward, where do we see ourselves in the next five years? And certainly, we look to the management plan with the recommendations that are in there as far as the future of the Discovery Center and the education program, but we will be thinking hard about how much growth is appropriate for the, for the pine bush. How many more people do we want to see? We want to see more people coming, but up to what level and kind of what's our carrying capacity. So we'll be thinking about that and also thinking about looking at the big picture of who our programs are reaching right now and are there any deficiencies? Are there any groups that we're not reaching now that we could be? And so we'll be looking to that also to fill in some of those gaps. And one example is high school kids. It's difficult to get high school kids out because of the demands of their curriculum and also um, their, the way that scheduling program or uh, school classes are scheduled in high school. Sometimes it makes it difficult for high school kids to come out, but we are working on creating a new program um, that's specifically geared for AP environmental science and AP biology students to be able to come out and do some uh, monitoring out in the preserve. So we're hoping that with the development of some of these new programs, working with teachers, getting their input, that we can continue to reach some of those groups that we're not currently reaching right now. And it really is a, such a pleasure to be able to work as an educator here at the Albany Pine Mission, to work with the education staff. And so, um, it's just amazing to see some of the reactions of people that come out here to the pine bush and what they learn and how excited they are when they come out here. You get some really great comments, like one student said one day, we were walking down the trail and he was really excited about being out there and exploring and learning new things. And he looked at me and he's like, Miss Erin, this is better than bowling. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you get some really great comments, and uh, and we do see kids coming back with their parents, and and or their parents saying, I don't know why we're here, but my daughter really loved coming here with their class, and so now we're coming back as a family. So we're hoping to continue to reach people and help them to understand and appreciate the Albany Pine Bush. That's it for the presentation. I'm just going to add something. Um, in my career, I've, I've been to some of the best nature centers across the country, seen terrific education programs. Um, I can tell you, without a doubt, that what Erin and her staff are doing is really top-notch, and um, as evidenced by Erin just sort of touched on it, but these evaluations that I was just looking at yesterday, across the board, you know, they were highest ratings on every question that, that people were, were asked. So I'm, I'm just really pleased to be part of part of this and to be able to. I, I had told the staff recently that you know I haven't come to a lot of the programs yet because I just sense that they have it so together. I don't. It's not been a high priority for me, although I'm going to be making that a higher priority and, and trying to get to as many as I can. And I encourage you all to try to get to one or two if you can and tell. Be ambassadors for us, please. Go out and tell people. Um, bring your families here for the public programs. I'm always showing people the. The, um, we, we print every month, Wendy prints out a, a double sheet for each month, um, two-sided, and I just show people that. We are chock full of daytime, evening, kids, adult programs, uh, public, schools, and, and so the, the opportunities are, are endless, and I encourage you to all think about that, you know, when you go out into the world, tell people about us. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Aaron. Your enthusiasm is infectious, and uh, obviously, you and your staff are the face of the Discovery Center to so many people. Uh, so that's that's their initial impression, and I think it's a great one. So I appreciate it very much. Next, we're going to hear um, a presentation on mammal research from Amanda Dillon. Good morning, everyone. Um, like Erin said, my name is Amanda Dillon. Um, I have a joint position here 
I work for education primarily in the winter and then during the summer during the field season I'm primarily science. Um, so this morning I'm going to present to you on an ongoing project we have here in the preserve and um, that is camera tracking. So we had a few objectives going into this study. Um, the first was to observe and document cryptic wildlife in the preserve. And by cryptic wildlife I mean those wildlife that are difficult to see, either because they're very elusive um, or because they exist in small numbers, so you just don't see them very frequently. And some animals that we were interested in seeing were fishers and coyotes. Um, we were also interested in monitoring how the wildlife uses the managed landscape here in the Albany Pinebush Preserve, because as we all know, the preserve is in a constant state of management. Um, and we were also interested in calculating densities for selected species. So to start off the project, we had to pick a camera to do this um, wildlife camera trapping. Um, and uh, there are a lot of options out there, but with the recommendation of Dr. Roland Kays, um, who used to be our uh, New York State mammologist and um, is now at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, um, we purchased the Reconyx HC600, which is a, a good option for us. It has this hyper fire ability, which basically it takes pictures very quickly. There's only a fifth of a second between each, each picture it takes. And it also has this high output covert infrared, which uh, basically allows the camera to take pictures without a flash that would distract the wildlife or affect their behavior. Um, so it takes really great photos at nighttime. So this is the camera we went with and we bought four of them to place around the preserve. For our study area, um, like I said, we were interested in seeing how these animals and how our community here is responding to management. So we decided to focus our study on areas where we have applied some management to restore the pitch pine scrub oak barrens. Um, this here is Connor Barrens East, and this is where we are now. The star is the Discovery Center. Um, and we also went with a cross 155 just across the street over in what we call Carter Barrens West. Um, and since we were interested in looking at the restored habitat, we wanted to look at the shrubland habitat, and that's what's outlined here with the grid. Um, so you'll see over in Carter Barrens East, there's a lot of habitat around here that isn't quite yet restored yet. And it's also, Carter Barrens East is a lot larger than Carter Barrens West. So basically, our, we had four cameras. We put two cameras in each location around the preserve. And in order to determine where those cameras went, we have a random number generator, and we just pick a number, and that number corresponds to a location on the grid. So every couple weeks we go out and we pick up the cameras and we move them to a new location on the grid. So these cameras um, have been out in the preserve since March 1st, and since then every couple weeks we've gone out and moved them around these two areas. So when we get out and we are actually deploying these cameras, there's some things we have to set on the cameras and some measurements we have to take. First, we want to set a few things on the camera. The first is sensitivity. We can set the camera to be high, medium, or low. Um, basically, just how sensitive is it going to be? Is, it, is, it, is a small animal going to set off that camera and make it take a picture? And we decided that we do want it to, we want to catch whatever we can, so we set the sensitivity on the cameras to high. Um, the pictures per trigger is just the number of pictures that the camera takes each time it's triggered. We set that to 10, so every time and, um, something triggers that camera, it takes 10 photos. The picture interval is how much space there is between each photo taking event. And like I said, this, this camera has this rapid fire technology, so we took advantage of that and we set our cameras to rapid fire, so there's only about a fifth of a second between each photo. The quiet period, if you wanted, the, if you wanted there to be a break after a triggering event, if you wanted it to wait before it could be triggered again, you could set a quiet period of a certain amount of time. We decided we wanted to just take pictures, as many pictures as we could of these, of these animals, so we set no quiet period. There's no delay between triggering events. We also set a time lapse on the cameras to take photos at twice a day, once at midnight and once at noon. And that's mainly for us to know that the camera is working properly. If we got to the camera and there were no photos on it, we wouldn't be able to know if that was because there were no trigger events or if the camera was malfunctioning. So by having it take the time lapse photos, that just helps us know that the camera is working. And uh, once we've got the camera all set up, we have to measure one last thing, and that's detection distance. And that's basically the distance that an animal has to be from the camera in order for the camera to detect it and take the photos. So uh, we measure the detection distance, just walk backwards, and the camera flashes a red light at us until it can no longer sense us. And we measure that distance. 
So, results so far, like I said, um, the cameras that we have out there have been deployed since March 1st of this year. Um, and as of yesterday, when um, I went out and moved to the two cameras over in Connor Barron's West, our cameras had captured about 63,000 images, a little over 63,000 images. Unfortunately, the majority of those are blades of grass moving in front of the camera on windy days. But about 22% of the photos are of wildlife, which adds up to about a little over 14,000 images of wildlife that we've got here in the preserve. And I've broken that down for you by camera um, and also by um, location. So looking at this, it's kind of interesting to see that although Carter Barrens West is smaller, we're getting more photos overall in Carter Barrens West and also more photos of animals in Carter Barrens West. But as far as species richness, that's kind of, that's pretty consistent. We're getting about, we got 10 species over in Carter Barrens West and we got 10 species in Carter Barrens East. So in total, we've captured 14 species um, on our cameras so far. So I'm just gonna introduce you to what we've gotten so far. Uh, this is a mouse. <laughs> it's way down here in the corner. Um, this is one of the downsides of the wildlife camera trapping is that unfortunately you can't always identify the animal species which it's, it's inherent in it, especially with small animals like this that you need a hand to identify anyway. So it is still cool to see that these cameras are sensitive enough, sensitive enough to pick up animals this small though. We got a lot of photos of white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer tend to hang out in front of the cameras. Once they're there, they're there for a lot of trigger events. Um, so we have, we've gotten deer all summer, we've gotten all stages of deer. Um, definitely the majority of our pictures are of the white-tailed deer. Uh, this down here in the corner is a coyote. This was one of the animals we were hoping to observe with our camera traps. So we were very happy. Um, kind of interesting, we've only seen the coyote over in Connor Barrens East. We haven't documented any over in Connor Barrens West yet. Um, and talking about cryptic, we've only had three trigger events capture coyotes and we have less than 30 photos of them. So, yeah. Amanda, is there a... Uh clear passageway for the animals between east and west? Or are they separated by 155? There is a trail that goes underneath 155, um, but yeah. I don't... Do you ever think about putting a camera right there maybe to see if there's any passage between? We, we do, we are interested in using the cameras to monitor things specifically, yes. Um, at, at this point, we're still kind of in the random stage, kind of just moving around and seeing what we can get. Um, but yes, that, that has definitely been a consideration. Um, I guess 155 is a pretty effective barrier between the two areas though. Yes, I, I think so. I mean, depending depending on the type of wildlife, um, yeah. Um, it's also possible that, I, I have no idea, we're not sure, like if coyotes, maybe maybe it's just too small of a habitat over in Carter Barrens West because it's, it's much smaller than Carter Barrens East. But definitely, we're happy to, to document these guys. We know they're here and now we have a group. Uh, this is an uh, eastern chipmunk. I've got plenty of those guys on um, Carter Barrens East and Carter Barrens West and all over the preserve. Um, this is another animal that we were extremely happy to document. Over here, he's kind of hard to see, just get his eye shine. This is a fisher. Now, what was interesting about this documentation of this animal was that fisher are, are a woodland animal. They like forests. They're more consistent with an Adirondack forest. But they are in the preserve because the preserve currently is about 75% forest. Um, but what was interesting was that this animal was documented in Carter Barrens West. And if you remember from the map, Carter Barrens West was largely restored to, to pitch pine scrub oak barrens. There's not a lot of forest remaining in that area of the preserve, with the exception of some perimeter areas. So it was very interesting for us to see this guy. We were expecting to document uh, any fisher in Carter Barrens East rather than Carter Barrens West. So it was interesting. We're, we haven't seen him again. We've only had this one detection of this animal. Um, but that's one of the reasons we're going to continue this project through the winter because it'll be much easier to document these particular kinds of animals in the winter with leaf off. Uh, gray squirrel down there in the bottom. Lots of them in the preserve. Woodchuck. <laughs> Got lots of, lots of good woodchucks, both in Carnivore Barrens East and Carnivore Barrens West. Uh, this is a rabbit. Again, a, a downside of, of camera trapping, I cannot tell you. I, I mean, it's possible someone else could, and I am going to pursue that and find out if someone else can identify whether this is a New England cottontail or an Eastern cottontail. When we realized we were documenting rabbits on the cameras, 
we started looking for scat in the area in front of the cameras, hoping that we could collect that scat and extract DNA and, um, and then be able to identify which species we have. Unfortunately, it hasn't been fruitful. We haven't been able to find any yet. Um, so this is good because it's a daylight photo. So I mean, it's possible that, that someone at the museum might be able to tell us if this is New England cottontail or Eastern cottontail. Uh, this is another animal we got a decent number of photos of. We got this animal, a gray fox. Um, we got them in Carnivorans East and Carnivorans West. But what was special about Carnivorans West was that we not only documented gray fox, but we documented gray fox kids. Um, so this uh, particular female traveled in front of the camera numerous times with her brood of three kids. And uh, from my understanding, that's a pretty successful brood size for a gray fox. So it's great to see that not only are these animals breeding in the, in the managed areas, but they're also having successful breeding events. So it was nice to see them, but super cute. <laughs> um, and this, our final mammal here is a skunk. Um, and, and this is a way, this is kind of showing that not only do we get to document the animals, but we can observe some behaviors. And sometimes it's kind of fun to try and put a story to what's happening because when we documented this animal earlier in the evening, he kind of waddled in with his tail down. When he came back later in the evening, for some reason his tail was up. So something got his gusto up. Not sure what it was, um, but it's interesting to see the behaviors that we see on the cameras as well. So we also caught some birds on our cameras. Of course, we caught lots of turkeys, big flocks of turkeys, especially in the um, this is an American woodcock, which is one of our very cool birds that we have here in the preserve. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think this guy was displaying in front of the camera, which would have been ideal. He was foraging, uh, but it's still very cool to document these guys. They're really hard to find. They blend in very well. Uh, this is a northern flicker. Uh, uh, yellow shafted is the, the eastern subspecies, which you can clearly see from the yellow on the wings. And we got some a uh, good handful of photos of American robins foraging about. So this is oh, I'm not available. I'll play it for you afterwards from the file. Um, this is a video that Wendy Craney helped me put together. We just kind of strung a whole bunch of photos together and made a movie. So I'll play that for you afterwards. So in addition to um, seeing these animals and documenting where they are in the preserve, we were, of course, interested in seeing how they're responding to management. The pine bush, the type of habitat we're trying to respond here is, or, or, I'm sorry, trying to restore here is an early successional habitat. And disturbance is inherent in that kind of habitat. And here in the pine bush, that disturbance comes in the form of management. Uh, so this was a deployment that ended up in an area of the preserve here in Carnivorans East that was mowed this spring down to the ground with a hydro axe. Um, and this, this was seen, use was very visible from the trail. Um, and when we put the camera there, we weren't expecting to get a whole lot. It was right freshly managed, right after it was mowed, you can see all the slash. Um, but to our surprise, we did document wildlife. Uh, in the, we got lots of deer photos in this freshly managed landscape and also turkey. So it's good to see that, I mean, even when the habitat isn't necessarily suitable for these animals, they still are traveling through it. So we're not creating barriers to their movement. So it's nice to document this. We did get some unexpected results. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, off-trail activity. And we're kind of uh, pursuing this and maybe making this another objective of our study to kind of try and quantify what is the extent of off-trail use here in the preserve and using these cameras as a, as a way to do that. So you may be wondering, <laughs> what do the animals think about these cameras? Uh, they do occasionally seem, seem to, to acknowledge them. Sometimes they just kind of turn and look at them. That fox kind of just looks like she's got a whiff of something. I'm not sure. Um, but sometimes they do come up and investigate the cameras. But we haven't seen any photos yet that, that um, show that the animals are, that the cameras are adversely affecting their behavior. They basically come up, investigate the cameras, and then go back about their business. It doesn't seem to affect their behaviors much. Is there some kind of audio signal given off by the camera when it photos? No, well, not that we can hear. The, the, the animals, some animals can sense the cameras. We're not sure if they are hearing a mechanism in the camera or if they are seeing that infrared flash. We're not maybe, sure. Maybe they're smelling your hand. 
prints on the camera when you put it up. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, we're not, it's not exactly clear what it is about the cameras that that the, the animals are sensing, but it does make for some great photos. Um, <laughs> So like I said, this is an ongoing study. The cameras are going to remain out in the preserve, at least through the winter. And I'll be working closely with um, Paul Gallery. Paul Gallery um, was an apprentice of Dr. Roland Kays. So he's done a lot of uh, camera trapping on um, the Adirondacks and in the New York area. And uh, we're going to be working with him to use these photos to come up with density estimates um, and, and abundances for our animals. Um, I also have to thank a few other people. Of course, Dr. Roland Kays his, for his ongoing assistance with the project. Also, Lisa Pepino, who's pictured here, she is a graduate student working on her amphibian research in the preserve, but she finds time in her busy schedule to help us move these cameras around every once in a while. Also, our conservation science technicians, um, Ashley and Lily, who Chris, Chris um, recognized before, and of course, uh, Neil Gifford, the conservation director, who's made this all possible. Um, so, before I take questions, I'm going to see if I can open that video for you. for helping me put this together. Um, so this is just a, a bunch of pictures strung together. Um, this is a white-tailed deer herd over in Carner Barrens West. Um, this is very early spring. I think it's, um, it's mid-April. Um, so this we were concerned with documenting abundances of certain species. The white-tailed deer is one that we are particularly interested in. It's, it's kind of been a point of contention for a while now. Do we have too many deer? Do we have too little deer? We really don't know. So hopefully this camera trapping will allow us to actually come up with a population estimate for the preserve. Um, and you'll see um, as, the, as the movie plays that there is a deer here with a collar on. This is Beast. Um, Beast uh, was collared and tagged in 2002 by Carl Parker from the DEC. He tagged a few deer that year. Um, but Beast is the only one remaining. Um, she was called Beast because the frequency for her, the radio transmitter on her collar was 666. <laughs> um, but so in 2002, Beast was aged at two and a half years old. So she is at least 12 and a half years old here today. And um, all of these deer with her are likely her progeny from former years. So she is quite the matriarch over there in Conor Barron's West. Um, and you may be worried that the collar looks like it's rubbed on her neck, but this is early spring, so all these deer are kind of losing their winter coats. Uh, so we think the collar just rubbed off her winter coat because every time we move the cameras over there, Beast found them and she put herself right in front of them. So and she's looked she's looked healthy and, and well all summer. So. Um. so Thanks, Amanda. Does anyone have questions uh, for Amanda? Yeah. Amanda, um, I know for a while there was a, uh, had a couple of uh, fishers where they were doing tracking and you could uh, get on the website and follow them, mm -hmm. where, see where the fishers have been and stuff like that. Um, and I haven't checked lately, but is there a spot on the website where people can like see what wildlife is, you know, where you could download some of these photographs uh, to, you know, to bring more interest in the Pine Bush uh, websites. Absolutely. Um, we don't have we don't have a link set up or anything on the website so people can see these photos directly. But I did just recently um, put up a post. We have we have um, kind of a blog going on the actual website. It's under news, and I put up a blog post about the camera trapping, and I put up a photo of our, our cutest things yet, which was the, the fox kits. Um, and that was also put on Facebook. So um, it does, it does, people really connect with that. So it's probably something we'll, we'll continue to do. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. very much, Amanda. Thanks. Okay, uh, final item on the agenda is uh, other business and future meetings. Uh, next meeting is December 20th here at 9.30.
Hopefully there'll be some snow on the ground by then. Unlike last year. Uh, and then we meet again in March. Uh, so, that's about it, right? Yeah. Unless anybody else has anything. Okay, we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Okay. okay, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.